if it wasn't for God, I would probably be six foot under. And I know this because I have close, close friends that, have, that were not in God's will, that did not know God, and say to say, they're all gone. I was a gang member, I was a killer. I was a sociopath. I was sexually molested pretty much my whole life. Got a taste of this, this violence. It's scary, but it felt good. Talk about this shameful little secret. It was so traumatic. Satan stole my virginity. I was standing at the gates of hell. It's been an incredible journey. I get so emotional because it's just a transform my life. Your suffering's come to an end. It was like a dark tunnel, but all of a sudden, at the end of that tunnel, I could see a little light. It just came pouring out of me. And then everything changed. My whole life is different. Forgiveness, hope, and ultimate redemption. God, the one you've been searching for, was real. My story, my desire will be for people to see how God can work through anybody's life. And also to show people that God is still the same. He hasn't changed a bit. He doesn't change. And he's still a God of wonders, just like Psalm 77, 14 says. He's a God of miracles. He wants to show his power to people all over the world for one purpose so that people will realize who he is and give their lives to him, which will be the ultimate miracle for anybody's life. When you give your life to God, man, nothing beats that. Because for eternity, you're gonna be in his presence, where there's no sorrow, no pain, nothing, there's peace. Stephen, you are the president of Canada Mobile X-Ray Incorporated mm -hmm. and Physiologics Diagnostic Imaging. And that's located both in Calgary in Edmonton. Medically speaking, what is a miracle? Well, I don't know whether you can, um, you know, differentiate between medical and, and otherwise, but a miracle in, in and of itself is a surprising and welcome event that is no natural or scientific explanation to it. It defies all the scientific laws, it defies all the natural laws. That's how I see and define a miracle. Stephen, your story has a miraculous beginning, and some may not see it that way or believe as such, but you believe it. And so I want you to take us back to your beginning, before it actually began, and I want you to explain and tell us the story of the miraculous with your mother and your father. Sure. So I'm originally from Zimbabwe, and just like you rightly said, my story begins with my parents. So they got married in 1966. Now, if you understand uh, the culture back then, even now, I think, once you get married, you're expected to have a baby in your hands nine months from the date of marriage. It wasn't the case with my parents. It wasn't even 18 months or 24 months. It was a way longer than that. Four years, they did not have any kids. Until one day, an uncle of my father's, he approached my dad and says, Fanwell, that was my dad's name, uh, Fanwell, I know you've tried everything, but I've met a man who has introduced me to Jesus, and I am pretty confident that this Jesus will give you what you're looking for and more. And obviously he was talking to a captive audience right there because they had nothing to lose. He says, okay, I'll go. So they went to um, this gentleman by the name Ezekiel Guti, amazing man of God. The first thing that he did, he led my parents to Jesus Christ. And after that, he prayed for them. Nine months from then, my brother was born. This is four years after trying. And naturally, they named my brother Samuel after the account in the Bible. You know, Hannah prayed for a child and God gave him and, named, and was named Samuel. They became strong Christians. And in that process, or that period, they started getting persecution. They were being ostracized by their family members, but they did not give up because what they had found through Jesus Christ was 
worth more than anything that, you know, was out there. And that's when I was born, during that time of persecution. And then Nebni Stephen, obviously from the Stephen in the Bible, was persecuted. But they did not give up still. They kept serving God. Now, for them to become Christians, as you mentioned, they suffered persecution. There was a risk? That was a huge risk because they're first-generation Christians. In the 60s, Christianity was maybe 40 years old then, and not many uh, indigenous people were Christians. So for them to forsake the traditional culture, it meant a lot. They were literally taking themselves away from the protection from the ancestors. And they were losing their, their ranking in the society. There was a lot they were losing. So that was huge persecution. Of course, in context, it might be different from different parts of the world, but in their context, that was huge. So speaking of miracles, um, let's go back to when you were seven years of age. Your parents became Christians, mm -hmm. followers of Jesus. And Christians talk a lot about being born again, that born again experience. And they talk about that experience as being the greatest of all miracles. When did that miracle happen for you? You are right there, Robert. Being born again is the greatest miracle from any perspective you look at. Because when you look at the physical miracles that happen, they have an expiration date. Look at Lazarus who was risen from the dead. He died again. But the miracle of being born again has in eternal consequences. Once you are born again, you are guaranteed to be in the presence of the Lord for eternity. We don't even have an idea what eternity looks like. We are limited here with our you know, little minds. So that is the greatest miracle. And when did that happen? That happened to me when I was seven years old in 1978. I do not forget that day. We were sitting around the fire around in the evening, and my dad was like, you know what, guys? I was, my, my older brother was nine years old, Sam. My younger brother was five. I don't think he really grasped what, what was happening, but my older brother and I, we kind of were excited. He began to tell us we needed to be born again and explained what it meant. He said being born again means you are being empowered to be a child of God. That got us excited, a child of God. You know, and he went on to say, being a child of God is being a child of the King of Kings, being a child of the maker of heaven and earth. That was it for me. The excitement was just, I couldn't wait to share this with my friends at school. I remember going to school the next day and saying in my vernacular, you know, maybe that, that'll capture it. In my vernacular, I say, Musiki wedenga di baba wangu. You know, the maker of heaven and earth is my father. And the kids were like, what? Your father is one who made all this? And the Sunday, the next Sunday, I had a bunch of kids from school that we went together to school so that they could experience the same excitement. So that was the excitement. I don't remember anything else from there, but except that excitement and feeling that the maker of heaven is my father and I would not lack anything. So you knew that Stephen changed that night? I knew and looking back, that excitement has been building on and on and on. I, I want to ask you about church mm -hmm. because your family in Zimbabwe attended a church called the Apostolic Faith Mission. Mm -hmm. Now, that church was founded by a gentleman called John G. Lake. And I remember years ago getting, uh, being given a book called God's Generals. In that book, I read a short biography right. of John G. Lake. I mean, he was this businessman turned preacher, then goes as a missionary to Zimbabwe and founds the Apostolic Faith Mission, the church that you went to. And what I remember reading about was all the unusual supernatural miracles and occurrences that took place. And mm -hmm. so tell me about your church. I mean, were you seeing miracles and incredible supernatural experiences as a young boy growing up at the Faith Apostolic Mission? Right, I'll go back to John G. Lake. He was Canadian, I'm not sure if you realize that, out of St. Mary's, Ontario. And then he moved to the United States and caught the fire from the Azusa Street. And he said, I've got to share this with the world. That's when he moved to Africa, South Africa first, and set up the first Pentecostal church in Africa. That's where AFM was born. Now, growing up in that church myself, I mean, miracles were commonplace. 
They were exciting, but they were commonplace. Now, I remember in 1984, our church was uh, organizing a tent revival where Rena Bonke was coming. And I remember my parents were intercessors. And Rena Bonke would go there and simple, not using uh, theological verbiage or things like that, just speaking the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, I would literally see blind eyes open. Cripples getting up of wheelchairs, people that I knew personally that were dumb and deaf, eyes popping open, tongues loosening and beginning to speak. And it was simple, in the name of Jesus, speak. And then I said, I. So these were visible, tangible miracles. Yes, that I, that I saw and we, we saw as, as kids. And, and the one thing that my dad would tell me is, if you believe in Christ and you stay in him, those are gonna be your daily Okay, I mean, happenings in your life. Hmm. Stephen, let me ask you, why do you think we don't see that kind of church today that you grew up in? Sometimes miracles happen for a reason. Kind of like when the children of Israel left Egypt, there was a miracle of the Red Sea. And then when soon as they got into Canaan, manna stopped. So they said in miracles that happen for a reason. But what is happening in this, at least from my experience, living in Canada and the US, things that we would normally pray for in Zimbabwe, for, for the next meal, for shoes, for school, for college, they're at your fingertips here. So you get weakened in your faith. You don't really have a reason to pray for miracles because everything, oh, there's COVID, what is the government doing? Instead of us saying, okay, what can we do to provide a solution? Kind of like what happened with Joseph. In prison, the king would seek for him because he was plugged into his God. So to answer your question, I think an awakening needs to happen because this God that I'm talking about, we were introduced by Americans and Canadians and British. So I know that the truth, the seed, the foundation is here. We just need an awakening and we begin to walk in those miracles again. That will happen and I know and I believe it in my heart that it's gonna happen. Okay, so in talking about miracles, mm -hmm. there, there came a turning point in your life at age 20. Mm -hmm. You're in Zimbabwe with a group of guys, you go out in the bush, something strange happens. What took place? Yes, so we were taught to pray and Growing up, would set aside days that would go out. If the church was busy, would go out in the bush. So this particular Friday, we were out praying for something like four hours, and there was a loud sound. And then we saw fire, and some felt heat. I didn't know feel the, the heat, but I, I saw the fire and heard the sound. And we thought, oh, the bush we were around was burning. But we were not perturbed. We were at peace. We kept on. And when we were done, we went down to where, you know, I parked my car, close to where it looked like the fire was. And we were all surprised, like, guys, where is that fire? And it clicked into us that, oh, that was the presence of God. We realized that God had visited us in that place. And that was in 1999. So what did that mean to Stephen? That, you know, it boosted my, my faith, my confidence, and what happened, uh, unfortunately, the, the economy for a country started just going down. And a lot of people were going through stress and losing everything. I, mean, I know my parents, for instance, they lost all their savings, their pension, because the economy just tanked. But because we were plugged in God, we knew that God does not operate on the economy of the world. And we stayed in His presence. We, we, we started to pray as, as young boys, and, and just God started opening doors in ways that are just we can't explain, like I said, a miracle, you cannot explain it. You can just say, wow. So in your mind, that was God? That was God. Mm -hmm. I want you to describe another supernatural occurrence that happened to you on a farm. You were married at the age of 27. Correct. And then through a series of circumstances, if I understand correctly, you obtained a farm with a business partner mm -hmm. and you started growing corn. But there was also a unique, strange occurrence that happened that through that, mm -hmm many people believed in the God that you believed in. Yeah, so the way we acquired the farm, that was another miracle on its own. Actually, my father-in-law had prayed for a 
Danish gentleman by the name of Knuth, who had, who had been diagnosed of cancer and was given six months to leave. So he had come back to Zimbabwe to just wrap up his business and go back and die. And my father-in-law, um, El Danyazo, just prayed for that gentleman and he got healed. And he offered him the farm. And my grandfather said, no, we don't, we don't pray for reward. And then when I married, he had prayed like three years before I got married. And then when I married, he insisted and then that's how I ended up being on that farm. So what happened now, we grew corn on that farm. And then there was another f you know, portion that we grew legumes, you know, horticultural products. So when you grow corn, there's a time where you don't need any rain. If it rains on the corn, you lose it. And then we have these vegetables that we needed rain on because we didn't have any irrigation system. We were depending on the rain. And I had seen the miracles happen. On one such occurrence, Bonky was preaching at this uh, revival that's in 1984. And there was a thunderstorm coming and he just said, rain, stop in the name of Jesus until we're done. And the rain stopped. As soon as that service was done, there was a downpour. So I said, that God who did that miracle there, God, I want rain to rain on the vegetables that I need here to grow and not to rain on the corn because we'll lose it. Within minutes, it rained and there was a demarcation from where the corn field started and the vegetables field was. And the 30 employees, farm workers there, they were like, we want this God. And they gave their lives to Jesus right on the spot. So they saw this miracle. They saw this miracle. That you prayed for. Yes. And it just, it wasn't even longer than a minute, that prayer. Just a simple prayer. And they responded and gave their lives to Christ. They did. Now your journey to Canada after this is interesting. Um, and and there's, there's a reason why you ended up in the city of Calgary. Mm -hmm. That name Calgary is important. Tell us that story. So going back to that farm, other farmers saw what we were doing and they were saying, oh, come and use our farm. So on one such farm, we went with my partner to set up. And lo and behold, who is there? <laughs> There's soldiers with guns pulled, June 2000. Just barely a year since we had got married. And I remember the one guy screaming, you guys are being used by white folk to take our land. And I'm like, oh boy, what is happening here? And the instinct in me was to engage and back up. So I backed up for about 500 meters. And for some reason, he did not pull the trigger. He could have. He did not pull the trigger and managed to get out of that place. And I went and sent with my wife. I said, honey, I don't see us raising a family here. I don't feel safe. We've got to leave. That's when we went on Monday uh, we went to the U.S. Embassy, applied for a visa, and we said we're going to try the U.K. If it doesn't work out, we go to the U.S. So we went to London, hated it. Moved to Oxford, did not like it at all. And we said, okay, let's go to Texas. And Texas, uh, we had sent uh, two of my siblings to Texas. As soon as we got there, something was like, okay, this is it. That was November 2000, we landed in Texas. And I went to college there. Um, getting comfortable, build a house. 2008, November, God said, you gotta go to Canada. I'm like, Canada? Who goes to Canada? <laughs> you know, from Texas. And we kind of pushed aside. And then he spoke to my wife. I said, when God speaks, I gotta listen. So we picked our bags, March 2009, left Texas, came to uh, Ontario, three days, God says, no, this is not it. Picked our bags, moved to Edmonton, and we, was, we started setting up a company in 2009 and 10. We registered our company and then God spoke in 2011, said you've got to go to Calgary. And we did not listen. We stayed in Edmonton. And things did not move at all. Until August 2014, it was so strong, we moved to Calgary. The moment we moved to Calgary, contracts opened. The business just showed up like unbelievably so. And then something clicked. I said, honey, do you remember what made us leave Zimbabwe? I said, no. I said, remember the incident at Calgary Farm? He says, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I said, where are we now? He says, wow. And our eyes just opened. We in Calgary City. We left Zimbabwe because of Calgary Farm. Now we're in Calgary City and we're seeing miracles opening in ways that 
again, we cannot explain. So there was a farm named in Zimbabwe, Calgary. Correct. And you ended up in Calgary. We ended up, in, we are in Calgary now. Stephen, one final question. If someone is watching and listening to you tell your story um, and, and has a difficult time in believing in miracles, how would you convince them that miracles are real? With every miracle that you see in the Bible, it's pointing to God. It's not pointing to what I have done, because honestly speaking, I don't deserve a single thing of what I have, none. I'll be lying, I do not. But it's all pointing to how, what God can do to a surrendered life. What God can do through a surrendered life. But the power is His, it's not ours. Ours is only the privilege to tap into that power. But are we willing to tap that into that power? It's just like, you know, we have electricity coming into our houses and we have a switch. When we turn that switch on, it's not me that has made that power come flow through. There is a source. But I have to be willing to get up and flip that switch on and let the power flow through. Before I castigate anybody who doesn't believe in miracles, I'll tell you, I'll be reticent into believing into miracles unless I'd seen one myself. And I thank God I've been fortunate that I've seen the miracles. And even to explain to some people, they find it hard to believe. How can there be a Calgary farm in Zimbabwe? How can you start a business that needs millions of dollars to set up with no money? How can you have be the president of physiologic diagnostic imaging where you've got radiologists, uh, you're saving the government $10 million a year, you're not even a doctor? How is that? How do you explain that? How can somebody believe that unless they walk? But how do you walk in that unless you believe? So the key really, this is why the Bible says it's you walk by faith, not by sight. Because by sight, it doesn't make sense. It's foolishness. So it's difficult to explain, but I can tell you it is there. Try, if you try it, you won't be disappointed. And you believe miracles are real? I believe they are real. Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. My pleasure, and thanks for having me here. If you want to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it can transform your life, you can request a free Bible by calling toll-free 1-888-482-4253 or visit www.gideons.ca forward slash request. You can begin your journey with Christ now.